Hi, welcome to What Happens Next from Shreya Nagarajan Singh Arts Development Consultant, where we speak to artists, performers, creative people from various disciplines about their work, how they are managing during the coronavirus lockdown, and where they see, see things going. Um, today, our guest is Kerala Vini. Uh, Kerala is an architect, interior uh, and furniture designer based in Chennai. She's the co-founder and principal designer at Madras Makers, along with Prem Balasubram. Madras Makers are known for their fine hardwood furniture and bespoke architecture and interiors. I came across Madras Makers in Architectural Digest a few years ago and really liked what I saw, so I reached out to them. I think this was back in 2017. Their furniture really blew me away and then when we met, we had a really nice conversation and um, I've been hoping to keep in touch with them going forward. Um, it was pretty nice to see their furniture show up in various projects that I have shot. So it's clear that architects really like their work too. So um, I thought speaking to a furniture designer gave me a different perspective on furniture, which is something I was already interested in. Um, so I thought that would be a good time to bring Carola into what happens. Hi, Carola. Hi, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Yeah, good. It's nice catching up. It's been a while, I guess. <laughs> it really has. And it looks like the only way we seem to be catching up these days is for the game. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> yeah. So um, let's just jump right into it as quickly as possible. Okay? Um, Carola, you guys are in a, in a unique position from most people because you're not only an architect or a designer, but you also manufacture um, whatever you design. So you manufacture it yourself in your own factory, right? So yes. can you just tell us a little bit about how your setup is and how you typically work? Yeah. So we broadly have two segments to how we work. So we have a design team and yeah. we have the factory of uh, the makers. Okay. So um, the factory is a sort of a much larger setup in, in, in terms of the real estate area itself. We have uh, carpenters, uh, polishers, cutters, and we have a team that manages them. All right. So um, the factory in itself um, has a lot of uh, processes involved, right? Um, you need to streamline a lot of work in the sense uh, uh, so that work happens in a certain kind of way as smoothly as possible. And things um, happen in a certain sequence so that we achieve whatever we want to make in the uh, stipulated amount of time we have, right? right. Um, design, on the other hand, is a slightly more, uh, what do I call it? It's a creative uh, sort of a setup. So there are a lot of impromptu things happening. Creative ideas come uh, from, you know, inspiration comes from anywhere. So uh, we would be having a library of, uh, uh, you know, ideas that we've already thought of and, um, uh, at the same time, there are a lot of presentations happening on what would actually work for certain customers who approach us. And there are projects uh, where we conceive the entire house per se. You know? So there is uh, everything right from the macro right to the micro happening in, in that sort of work. So right. that way, I, uh, the kind of setup we have is uh, very dynamic. Um, there is a lot of uh, things to be thought about and there's always uh, a lot of creativity happening uh, where I work, you know. So. Okay. Well, that's the best kind of workspace. Yeah. Um, how many people do you have on your team? So, uh, currently we are about uh, 22 people. Okay. Uh, I'm talking about the entire team, you know, our uh, designers and... Uh, carpentry team and everything, everybody put right. together. Okay. And um, so when you were saying that you're, you have a factory and you have a design team, um, yes. during the lockdown, I assume that your factory obviously you wouldn't have been able to function, right? 
Um, yeah. So how how was that part of your team handling it? How were they coping and what were they able to do? So um, as with most organizations, we had uh, closed down our operations for a good sixty days. Sure. Um, and uh, of course, we were working. The design team was alive uh, virtually, so we would be able to. We would be doing calls uh, through Zoom and WhatsApp. <coughs> we would yeah. exchange uh, designs through. Um, you know, there is the cell phone is a good enough tool to exchange whatever you need to exchange. Uh, yeah. So the design uh, work has been going on through this uh, period. but um, of course we have not been able to produce anything during this time so right. what we've done is we use this time to in fact uh, structure a lot of things yeah. you know because uh, the design team to the production team needs to have a really good connect so yeah. that work happens um, as streamlined as possible so in fact every day we are trying to you know only get this better to make yeah. this relationship between the design and the production team better so i think this lockdown in fact has given us that uh, leverage of time um and um, we've we've done you know we're making as much effort as possible to resolve as many issues as possible at the design stage itself right okay. not not per se not just you know drawing a piece of furniture or detailing it to the core not that's that's just one aspect of it but right. in fact uh, being able to explain something to a carpenter without having to humanly interact you know if you can give them a set of a uh, very simplified absolutely no nonsense set of documents which you can share with the carpenter yeah you still you know most of our carpenters are not uh, from a really educated background to so to say right yeah. they read numbers they read letters and mostly they are were fluent with tamil not so much with english so we want to be able to get that communication set right okay that's that's something we've been working on um, during this lockdown it's something we wanted to do for a very long time but this period since you know you're fairly uh, not under much of pressure to Uh, deliver things at a particular <laughs> deadline so to say we've used that time to um, actually streamline that part of our process our work process um and as sorry, far as the factory I interrupt you for a second yeah. um i know there will be a lot of people who are watching this who may not have been able to make that sort of connect happen between their teams how did you manage it? especially when you say one of your teams is not as tech savvy as the other would have been so yeah. how did you manage that how did you bring that connect uh, together see um to very simply put it design is um quite organic uh sometimes radical right whereas production is something more empirical right you're dealing with numbers you're dealing with dimensions um so i think between design and production it's very important to tie these two things you know the more um uh, sort of radical the the whole design part of it where you have where you might just draw very impulsively draw a curve and then work your way up from there to build a furniture when it comes to actual production you need to think in terms of um how the carpenter will actually be able to make it Right? right you right. need to think about the tooling right you need to think about the kind of sections of uh, wood that is available and the the skill set of the carpenter itself okay so while you're trying to actually get these two to work synchronously it's important to um as much as you you have a creative impulse to do whatever you'd like to do it is important to actually engage with the production team also to see how pragmatic this is or how you can make what you what you create pragmatic right so while this is one part of the activity how you communicate what you're drawing is also very very important you cannot have missing dimensions you cannot have um 
what do I say? You can't leave anything to chance, right? right. You have to uh, notate, you have to be very, very, um, uh, what is the word? You have to be very precise. You have to be very articulate about what you're trying to communicate to the carpenter, communicate to the maker, right? right? Because if there is any point where he does not understand what you've drawn, he's going to scratch his head, he will come back and ask you. Right. Yes, so, in fact, uh, in the last, we've, we're an establishment uh, for the last seven years. So, this has been quite the learning that we've had. And we've been trying to get this, to bridge this gap that we've uh, had for a long time. And we're trying to make that better and better and better every day. Okay. And I think this is also probably a good time to uh, jump into something else that um, I've been wanting to ask you for quite a while. Um, yeah. It's that you do two types of design, right? You design furniture, but you also design architecture and interior. Yes. Um, how different is your approach um, between the two? Because um, I get the feeling, I mean, like you, you clearly describe what it's like to design furniture where you have to uh, look at it from how the, the maker is going to actually tune and execute it, right? So, yes. is that very different from designing interiors or an architecture or, or, or a building itself? Or is that also similar except it's different tools? Uh, to very simply put it, the principles uh, of design are the same. Whether it is uh, a building or it is just a room that you're addressing or it's a piece yeah. of furniture. But right. what changes uh, across these different scales is how you really approach. So when you're actually designing a piece of furniture, um, you're fairly, you fairly know within what, what are your dimensional um, constrictions, right? So you know a dining table, how big, you know, how, how large it's going to be. It's probably going to be an 8 by 3 or a 7 by 3. Uh, uh, you know, sort of a platform within which you design. So yeah. when it comes to a piece of furniture, you're working more on the detailed aspects of it, right? Uh, you're working in terms of the structure, in terms of the aesthetic, in terms of proportion. And um, when while that is the broader spectrum of the design, you also try and understand how each piece fits into what, okay? Yeah. And all of this is in fact completely designed before it goes for production. Yes. Okay. Okay. So, um, in my experience, what I have encountered between furniture and designing for a space is probably very sim as simple as this. So, um, let's say on, on interior, de in interior design, you take a CAD uh, file and if you're working on something, a rectangle is a perfect rectangle. You're working within a sort of a perfect geometry um, you're assuming a perfect geometry to put whatever you would like to design in that space. When it actually comes to an interior space, you would encounter some more challenges with this, which the site itself may pose to you, you know, sure. uh, you know, simple things like just straightening out walls, right? So if I should draw a relationship between something that's designed in the factory to something that the same object that needs to go into an interior space, right? So let's say a kitchen or a wardrobe. Yeah. So a kitchen is constructed in perfect orthogonal orthogonality, right? A 90 degree is a 90 degree because we construct it in the factory. But when it's actually moved to a site, you have the walls to take care of. You have floor and ceiling undulations. So all of these pose certain constrictions, although you might have drawn it perfectly on a cat drawing, so to yeah. say that your kitchen perfectly fits, but the interior That's itself obvious. might pose some challenges. So um, I'm speaking to you from a completely practical point of view, right? Yeah. So yeah. that that is probably what um, the broader differences that we have encountered in terms of designing an interior space to furniture design. But otherwise... Um, in terms of how how you address furniture design and interior design, they're pretty much the same. You, uh, it's in, it's important to have the right sense of ergonomics, 
uh, ratio and proportioning. Um, you know, you need to use the right materials, colors, um, the feel of light. Light is actually a very important part of um, how yes. it renders a space and a product. Yeah. Right. And how something is placed within a space. Right. You can that would in fact even command how a product is designed. So there's sometimes a dining table, for example, you might get a very good vantage point to be able to see it linearly. So you can actually see the length of the table. So you can see the eight foot part of the table. So yeah. there you there you think about how, you know, the, the, the perfect kind of a dining table that would sit there, whether whether it's a three leg or a simple straight leg uh, table. But at the same time, if you're going to see the shorter part of the table, you're going to address that differently, right? Yeah. So these are some of the uh, very important aspects of both interior design and furniture design. You can't really isolate them and say furniture design is done in a particular way, interior design is done in a particular way. Um, all of these have a lot of common ties within them to, in fact, make a space feel great. Yeah, and I think that's a pretty great answer because um, this would cover, I mean, it's also very similar to how um, people would ask me, could we do architecture and industrial photography? People will, uh, would, would ask me what's the difference in shooting between the two? Uh, again, how different is the approach? Um, photography remains the same, but there is a slight difference. So when I would like shoot in, uh, in a factory shop for, for an architect, mm -hmm. um, my approach is different from shooting a factory shop floor for the factory owner or for that company themselves. So, so but it's nice to hear that there are subtle differences, um, but the approach remains similar. Yes. And um, how did you get into furniture design, I mean, you studied architecture, but um, yeah. how did you specifically, and did, did uh, furniture design um, becoming your, one of your mainstays come organically to you, or um, was that some, was there another way you got funneled in? Um, see, furniture design, I would say, happened by chance, in fact, because, um, I, I wasn't even really aware that I was being funneled into furniture design because uh, Prem and I, when we started out, we, we actually started with spatial design only, right? But yeah. um, in fact, the, the aspect of hardwood, the, the aspect of using reclaimed hardwood for building furniture um, actually started with uh, Prem, so, who's the founder of Madras Makers. So he, in fact, was looking to make good products for his parents' house back in 2010. So okay. um, he, was, uh, he was actually working as a lighting designer at that point of time. And um, he, uh, when he was actually hunting for good furniture makers, he went and he couldn't find out uh, any. He got to doing this on his own. He bought some... Uh, logs of wood, he got hold of a carpenter and he started doing this in his garage on his own. Okay. So, um, and as I was uh, actually, I was freelancing at that point of time. And when I actually, you know, uh, started observing what he was doing, I was also very, a very slowly but steadily, you know, sort of drawn to it. And uh, before you know it, you're actually part of that. So, um, if you ask me if it was actually uh, furniture design, oh, it's a, a separate stream, or what is this? Uh, was it all so intimidating? Uh, I would say no. Because, um, you know, that's the beauty of actually studying a course like architecture, you know, it and in fact broadens your perspective and gives you so much confidence that you can actually do anything you want, right? It just takes that much more involvement and uh, uh, what do I say? You you just have to want to explore and learn everything you want to know about it, right? So, in fact, furniture design um, is something I would say 
if you if you have a good sense of scale and proportioning and if you understand the materiality of what you're working with so let's yeah. say it's wood that you're working with or metal that you're working with then i think or let's say even concrete or marble people are making things with anything you you know anything you can imagine today yes yes so yeah. so if you if these are the if uh, a few of these things if you can actually pay attention to i think you can actually make anything so yeah in fact uh, being able to make furniture has to a great extent liberated uh, our creative senses you know it's not like you know i am an architect i will do just this uh, or i cannot uh, design a space i will only design a big space there is nothing like that you know i think every aspect of design small or large is important to making uh, you know the space that you live um, very important to making the space that you live in very important yeah i could not agree more i have um, uh, i i could try my hand at it made a rickety bench but um, it still works uh, especially for the cats in the garden it works very well <laughs> so how has your approach uh, to your work changed uh, since the first lockdown came into effect um did you actually have any chance to prepare uh, for the lockdown you know before it was finally announced or was there just not enough time to do it i think we were prepared to some extent that you know we knew something of a lockdown was going to happen right uh, because uh, towards the end of uh, in fact third week of feb we realized that this was in fact a grave situation and uh, this is only going to accelerate yeah. so i actually had a meeting with you know everybody in the factory and said that you know something like this is going to happen a situation called a lockdown will be announced by the government wherein we may not be able to step out and uh, we might need to shut shop for a while you know yeah uh but um you know there's nothing to really worry uh if this happens it happens but see the thing is nobody in fact uh, thought this would be a 60 day affair you know i had yeah. most thought this would be a three week uh three week sort of a break and we would get back to things as if uh, as if it were normal uh yeah. but that wasn't really the case but um see i think um, in fact we started uh, we resumed operations um since last week in fact for the last 10 days we've been operational in very small uh, numbers so i oh. make sure we have about 25% of the strength um so that's pretty much what we've been doing in fact uh, even before the lockdown was announced we thought that in case there is an issue like this there will be very stringent uh, measures taken by the government so as to make sure that uh, you know people don't spread the infection around so yeah. if such is if such was the case we would ha- actually have to have people coming in smaller groups finishing smaller tasks and then making room for the next set of people you know so and that's exactly what we've been doing we probably thought we would be doing this uh, in 3 weeks but just that this has happened um, after a much longer break so okay. uh, yeah that's and the uh, and the people who work at your co- company do they do most of them live in madras or um, they yeah live here? all they... all my entire team is actually from madras okay um, just so that some of them stay sorry so everyone is in town uh, now everyone is in town everyone oh. is from town just that uh, most of them were depending on public transport earlier so yes. uh, and some of them come from very far off right from uh, bandalur and you know even uh, avadi and so our factory is located in ramapuram so for some people they travel as as much as 20 25 kilometers to to work so yeah, um fun. yeah and most of them have to uh, you know jump two three modes of transport to get to our office so they take a train early in the morning and then they jump to another bus and then take a mini bus and then come and then reach so um 
since the lockdown i have sort i have made it very strict that you know that just can't happen right you have to somehow uh, find a way of coming to factory on your own so uh, that is when i actually even discover that all of them have a vehicle but they just wouldn't use it right okay. so uh, yeah so this is in fact um, sort of made all of them use their own transport and somehow make their way and to the advantage of most of them they in fact reach our factory in half the time or sometimes even less than how much, how long it would take them uh, in any other mode of transport right and suppose the strain of driving uh, would be reduced with uh, slightly yeah, reduced traffic, traffic is slightly lesser now yeah and uh, we are also working in early morning shifts so they come okay. before it really gets too hot so they okay. come uh, wrap up uh by lunch and they go back home for lunch so okay. that, that's good. yeah that's also something we've been uh, doing yeah and is this um is this a system that you're going to probably set in place for at least the next few months i think not just the next few months but for a very long time i think even my carpenters and my my team per se is much more comfortable you know with emphasizing the fact that they can't use public transport to come to the factory they yeah. have made sure they they figure out their mode of transport and right now they are a lot more comfortable with that with the alternative so even they may not go back and take the public transport even if i ask them to so okay yes. that's uh, i think that's going to be an unexpected change for you guys to have yes yes because see there's this one thing that um, i encourage my carpenters to do is uh, you know cut down the commute time put in yes. put in more work time because that is something that will monetize that that is actually beneficial to you if there's no point spending 3 hours you know shunting and just exhausting yourself and not being able to do efficient work right if 3 hours is going to come down to 1 hour you'll be able to put in those 2 hours and it will actually be beneficial to both you know the the business and to them Right. so that is something i've been emphasizing but um, maybe for the next two quarters at least we may not be able to do too much of overtime work we may be right. we have to be restricted to a little bit of factory work timings maybe a 7 to 8 hour shift might uh, is what would work for some time yeah. but i think by if if this covid is behind us by end of the year i i think we'll we'll get back on our feet to as normal as, as it was uh by jan okay so let's hope that happens um i think now is a good time to shift tracks a little bit and um i'm i want to just ask you something about the customer experience so right. how do you, all this time how have customers been you know trying out your furniture before they place an order or customize or buy um because i guess that's a very big part it's like trying on clothes trying on furniture right it is etc you probably that's going right. to use it for generations rather than just a few years absolutely so have they been trying uh, out your furniture before do you have a showroom or and how will they try it out in the future when probably you will need to limit the number of people who can visit you or um, uh you know keeping distancing pro- uh, at least for the next few months so what's the difference you expect to have uh so we don't uh, we don't have a retail uh, outlet as of now we have a walk in factory so uh if there is an inquiry right up to before the lockdown situation i can explain to you how things work uh, so if there was someone keen on looking at you know the kind of they want to actually get a touch and feel of the product we invite them to our factory so okay. they can actually see finished products uh they can see how we work we we actually take tour them you know <laughs> through the entire factory so that's how the that's how it used to be but we've also had clients who you know we've had clients from uh, pan india um when we had clients from uh, we've had customers from delhi where uh, you know they wouldn't be able to come all the way to chennai or you know unless there was a situation for them to come so uh, 
a, la a large bit of it works with trust you know we they see how they've seen our work uh, on you know several pa platforms like instagram and uh, facebook uh, we share catalogs across emails and uh, before we actually start making a product for them in, in case they can't actually come and see it we yeah. we work out the design and you know get a sign off and then only go about even producing it okay. so um and when before we ship it we we get and get it fully assembled and we check it we send them photographs of the fully assembled product and say you know this is this is how it's come out right and then uh, once they're fully satisfied that's once that's that's when we send it right so probably uh, like an architecture client or is it uh, okay. so we have uh, so there again we have uh, a broad spectrum of clients so we have people who come approach us for just one piece of furniture and okay. then there is uh, there are some customers who uh, approach us for a few objects per se right so there be some furniture maybe some doors maybe just a kitchen uh, and there would be that sort of a package and then there is the third kind where we do the entire project for them where there's the design and build so in a in a circumstance like that it it's not just a factory visit that suffices you know there's a lot more than that it, 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 i think you have to own that relationship when you have to do a project uh, when when you have to do the entire house right so yeah. uh, sometimes it takes takes as long as 2 years uh, to even understand and you know uh, design the right things for them and uh, we almost become like best buddies by the time we Uh, yes. get to a point where we do this so it's not just the factory visit that matters so um so to that extent we we've, we've had some clients and if you're asking me if people can walk into the factory today uh, in today's situation uh, may not be right uh, we might try and do this as virtually as possible but um i i see this uh, in in very positive light because during the lockdown we had a lot of inquiries there were a uh, lot of people who saw us on instagram for example and they said you know i want this table you know i want to uh, once the lockdown is over i want to come to the factory in fact they're very enthusiastic right so you know we tell them yeah just hold your horses <laughs> we can't do this right way just wait it out we'll probably uh, you know uh, we can have rendezvous probably in june or july right okay so uh, just wait it out don't hurry that's that's probably what we tell so, i think that's a uh, it's pretty great that you have customers already knocking on your door um yes absolutely yeah, so, yeah. okay and uh, except for we haven't really gotten into any sort of marketing campaign so far right we don't uh, it's completely word of mouth it's organic uh, someone refers us to somebody and you know we get a call and they say yeah. you know i've been hearing about your work it's it's really nice i've been chilled. so i checked you guys on instagram so i i've i want to do something with you uh, that yeah. sort of thing so we've had uh, calls uh, from probably all over the country and we've had some uh, people inquiring uh, from you know across the globe as well the, okay. there were some people who in fact wanted to meet us before the lockdown but unfortunately things uh, shut for a bit but you know the, they're still persistent they they want to reach out to us when things are slightly better so i think um, what is important at this this time is to stay optimistic and uh, we've uh, and stay as sagacious and uh, look at the bigger picture right okay. uh, in fact as an organization uh, in the last 7 years we've seen several challenges like uh, okay. within about one and a half years of setting up we had the floods in 2015 so yes, yeah. it, our uh, operations at that time came to a grinding halt in fact our machinery was we our factory was submerged in 15 feet of water so yeah. uh, our our machines were completely uh, conked off we had lost um, you know uh, i mean we had to completely do a lot of uh, electric uh, wiring um, we lost some computers you know that sort of machinery but i think 
one of the most important things uh, that has stood steadfast by us is the wood right i think that's a, that's the, i think you don't need any greater encouragement or a testimony to go about doing what you do when you have uh, a material like uh, teak wood standing for you all the time right so um, i think uh, i look at the, the way i look at the corona the covid situation yeah, itself yeah. is more like a long vacation right we are stepping back and doing things like we had a long vacation and now let's get to work that's that's the uh, mo we are on and i oh. think very soon we'll we'll uh, get back to our feet and to and to complete uh, normalcy okay that's a that's a nice positive uh, message to send out um, and i think uh, i remember uh, you and prem talking to me about the how things were at your factory uh, after the the floods because i think i met you soon after the soon floods. after i think that's right yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. so it, and that was when i that's when you i mean you pointed at your conference table i think and said um, this entire table was under water at that yeah. time <laughs> i'm glad you remember that that oh, table is it's it's still in the same shape i mean there's nothing that's changed about it we've not even done a touch up or polish or anything it's just the way it is So. I I remember that very clearly, and I remember the furniture very clearly as well. And yeah. uh, we just lost power here, um, so my glasses are fogging up. Um, oh. So you said you have never done any um, uh, marketing and just were uh, relied on word of mouth and let your work speak for itself, right? Um, but now, are you planning to um, do any kind of marketing? Yes uh, so we've been out. thinking about this because we need to uh, we've been thinking about reaching a, a slightly larger audience as well so uh, we've been working on a website and uh, it will be out there soon so um, because one of the other uh, other things that we have to keep in mind is we've been working on uh, so far we've constructed about 5 more than 500 unique objects right Okay. None of them uh, repeating more than the maximum we produce of one object is probably in ten numbers. You know, we've never got into a sort of a mass production thought process at all. We've been completely bespoke, and uh, to this day, that's how we've been. But uh, from a slightly thinking in terms of a uh, you know from a slightly more economic standpoint, um, it is important to have that boutique and bespoke experience as well. but uh, through the website we are trying to standardize a few objects uh, a few products that can be uh, you know maybe we we keep revising it for a for every quarter or every six month sort of a periodic thing but we are thinking of coming up with a line of seasonal furniture which people can uh, sort of have access through anywhere in the oh, uh, anywhere in the globe through the website and um, that's going to be available um, off the shelf or is that still going to be customized see there will be some level of customization to any furniture that we make right okay. because i can't um, i can't say i make only 8 by 3 tables and you better have space for an 8 by 3 i can't say that right? right so there will definitely be um, more than customization i think the right word uh, to use here would be um maybe it's a few choices right okay. so um th- the design would be pretty much the same so if you're going to choose let's say a cassette table right we have yeah. a product called the cassette table so there um uh we might have de- depending on the proportion of the table we might come up with two three sizes so okay. you can work out and see what size fits best in your space right oh. and um if you're going to go for a single seat lounge chair or a sofa you will definitely have some options on customizing the upholstery uh, right. right and we also have uh, something called the pico series so it, we have small tables we have large tables we have a pico table with a little drawer in the bottom uh, yeah. we have a pico table with just a ledge so those sort of options can be made available 
right? Okay. So uh, I would say more than customization, these are a few choices which you will have. So okay. once you just say, yeah, this is exactly what I want, uh, what we would have in terms of components will be put together at that point and finished for you, right? So in, in a sense, it is actually customized for you. Okay. okay. I think that's uh, I think that's good because people who, uh, if they're going to be buying it by looking at your website and your Instagram, I think they will also like to know now that you've said it, that, they, that there are choices to fit yeah. their space. Yeah, that's right. So now I think we're coming up to the time to wrap up. Um, is there anything in particular you have been working on in the lockdown that you weren't able to work on um, before that? Um, so in terms of... Uh, See, personally, there have been a lot of things I've been able to do. Like, uh, I've been delving a little bit more on my hobbies, like uh, playing the piano. I, I practice regularly. I, I, during the lockdown, I was, that's, that's something I was able to do. Um, I was able to do a little bit of gardening. And um, a lot of learning, right? So, I've been looking at um, a lot of um, simple things like just reorganizing the home. I've been cleaning my wardrobe, right? So that, the, the very act of the, the whole cleaning process is, has given me a much better idea of, you know, the importance of doing certain things in a wardrobe in a particular way. In the, the, the takeoff point, I've actually been reading up a little bit of Marie Kondo and her uh, methods of organizing and yeah. uh, that is actually, I think, very important. Uh, that I, I have a lot of takeoff points from there to designing a wardrobe, right? Okay. Um, it's important to um, design efficiently. So that is something, um, and, and you know, fat-free design. So that's something that I've really uh, sort of been very conscious about one, during this lockdown. And uh, there have been um, a few, um, I've been for a long time wanting to develop a series of furniture um, that's as ephemeral as possible, right? Uh, when I say ephemeral, it's easy to move around, right? It's really okay. lightweight. You can just, you know, just wrap it up, just fold it and just carry it wherever you, wherever you want, right? Yeah. And um, a lot of my friends have been having uh, babies. So I've been designing some craters and cribs. And uh, that's been a lot of fun. In fact, uh, a cradle has a completely different set of uh, ergonomics and anthropometry to, uh, that you need to understand to come up with. You need to keep in mind the parent that will be using it and the child that will be sleeping in it. You know? Yes. Uh, so that's something I've really had a lot of fun working on. Um, and uh, of course, as a team, uh, we've been, uh, the website is something we've been working on. We've used this time to work on the website and a yep. fair bit of uh, structuring work has also been happening. Uh, that's something which we want to implement. Um, yeah, yeah. So we've been working on that. As well. yeah. Okay. That's pretty great. So why don't, uh, could you just um, tell the people watching what's the best way that they can check out? your uh, furniture and if they need, if they want to get in touch, how can they do that? <clears throat> so, uh, we are actually, uh, in fact, our website has got Prem's number, so he's just a phone call away. Uh, you can always write to us and uh, we're on Instagram. Very soon our website will be out, so uh, you can reach us there as well. Um, okay. So, uh, and I think we are fairly very well connected in today's world. You know, it's not so difficult to access somebody when you've decided to, you know, reach out to them. So, yeah, it's all there. Okay, great. Yeah. So, um, I think this is a good time to drop this to a close. Um, Karola, thank you so much. I think this interview was, um, we, uh, you went really deep. And uh, I'm pretty sure a lot of people watching would have, and a lot to take away from it. That's wonderful. Thank you, Srina. Thank you for this opportunity. It was lovely talking to you. Yeah. Yes, likewise. Yes. And uh, thanks so much. And thank uh, to the viewers, thank you so much for watching as well.
um, to to watch more interviews uh, as part of the What Happens Next uh, Instagram series. Please follow at Shreya Nagarajan Singh, and um, I'll see you in the next video. Thank you. Thank you.